scripture reading today is Ruth 3, 1 through 5, and Ruth 4, 13 through 17. <clears throat> Ruth 3, 1 through 5, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whom young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the, on the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you will tell me I will do. Ruth 4, 13 through 17. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you to this day without next of kin, and you may, you may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the church council of this congregation approved a plan presented by our security committee. Yes, this church now has a security committee just in the last year. We've installed keypads, pictured here, and we've upgraded our video monitoring system, and we'll all get used to it. But uh, on first encounter, it might uh, startle you because you might have always been able to just open that door and walk in during the business hours of the church or when you're here for an evening meeting. Um, but you will now uh, find the signage and the keypad that you see pictured there when you come to the main entrance of the church. And access will be provided if you're on a team or committee. You'll be given a code so that you can let yourself in in the evenings. And in the daytime, usually there's a receptionist there um, to greet you and to let you into the facility. We don't want to make it uh, difficult for anybody, but we do want to make it as safe as we can for everybody. Next year, we're going to change the locks. Hadn't been done in a long time, so that's another step toward some physical building security. And in the future, you will hear about some emergency exit drills. And I know this all seems kind of out of line with being the church and offering hospitality, but it was a year ago this month that that terrible event took place at First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs. And it caused us to start taking a closer look at things here, steps that we could take. Before that, it was Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. And last month, it was Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Now, all of that said, I have to tell you, I am not a person who lives in fear. Um, I let my kids walk to school on their own when they were little bitty. Um, don't have a, you know, I'm going to tell everybody all my secrets, but I'm, you know, I don't have alarms on things. I don't live like that. But there is a time where when you have access to resources to make things safer for the people in your midst, you take those steps. Of course, I have to tell you, and you already know this, statistically, it's much more dangerous to drive to church than to be in church. <laughs> but don't stop driving to church either. In light of events like the examples I just gave you, we would be negligent not to have some sort of security plan here where large numbers of people gather for events. When you know that there are risks, that can be avoided and situations that can be prepared for, then you take those steps within reason. And 
we believe that we are doing that here. Naomi and Ruth, in our scripture reading, found themselves in such a situation. They needed a different kind of security plan, but they needed a security plan nonetheless. And they were wise and resourceful in devising their security plan. Last week I shared with you that uh, it was going to be a two-part sermon, so if you missed last Sunday, I'm sorry, but it is on the church's uh, YouTube uh, video uh, channel and on the podcast, and you can find both of those through uh, the church's website. So if you want to get part one, you'll have to go back and catch that. Um, But if you've got your Bible or your Bible app handy, open up to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's a wonderful story, and I want to encourage you, whether you were here last week or not, um, it's four short chapters. So if you haven't read Ruth recently, go home and read it this afternoon or as part of your devotions in the morning this week. Um, and you'll be blessed by this story. So, it's the emigration story of a family that fled from a famine that was in their homeland, but after fleeing from that, they fell into greater calamity as immigrants in their new land. You remember that Naomi's husband, Elimelech, say that ten times fast, that's fun, he had died in Moab where they had settled having immigrated from Bethlehem and Judah there to make a new life. Both of Naomi's sons, after their father's death, ended up marrying Moabite women because that's who their neighbors were. And that wasn't in line with the traditions of their culture or their religion to marry outside of their own ethnicity and their own religious group. But then both of Naomi's sons died too, and that left two generations of childless widows. One daughter-in-law, Orpah, chose to go back to her home of origin, while the other, Ruth, chose to remain with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And that's where we left off last week. We left off with Ruth's pledge of loyalty to Naomi as they are about to head uh, from Moab back to Bethlehem and Judah. And we read these verses, familiar perhaps, maybe even read at a wedding you've attended. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. As an emigrant, Ruth now is leaving behind all that is familiar to her. She's leaving Moab to go to the new place. I would imagine that Naomi may have had a spring in her step at this point as they cross the dusty ground heading north along the edge of the Dead Sea before heading back southwest toward her hometown of Bethlehem. She is returning to things familiar. She has lost so much since she first left Bethlehem. Some might say that she's lost everything. I mean, she had lost her husband, both of her sons. She had been torn away from her neighbors and and her people. She has now lost her livelihood. Nevertheless, I'm sure there was an eagerness in her as she was heading home. The two women arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, the scripture tells us. The famine that had led to them leaving there in the first place, that famine has ended and there is barley to be harvested. And yet Ruth and Naomi have no means to support themselves. Even if there's food in the land, they don't own any of the land and they don't have any money to access it. But Elimelech now deceased, he has a relative, Boaz. And Boaz is described as being a prominent rich man. Boaz had land, he had workers, he had barley to harvest. And so Naomi sends the young, capable Ruth to go along behind those who are harvesting Boaz's crops. And Ruth's task is to pick up the scraps that they leave behind in the field, scraps that will be the women's survival. 
Gleaning was a common means of subsistence for poor people, for people who didn't have their own land. And it still is in some parts of the world today. Well, eventually Boaz sees Ruth, doesn't know who she is. She's tagging along behind his workers. And so he questions her. Who is she? Where has she come from? And upon hearing of the family connection, Boaz responds kindly to her, allowing her to continue the gleaning in his fields, even ordering the young men who are working the fields to leave her be, leave her alone. And he sees to it that when his workers take a break, she gets some food to eat. He even instructs the workers to deliberately leave behind a little bit more so that she can gather enough for she and Naomi. Well, when Ruth returns home to Naomi with such a big haul from her days of gleaning, Naomi is pleased and she praises God and offers blessing upon the name of Boaz for his generosity toward them. And then Ruth goes back day after day and continues the gleaning in the fields through the rest of the barley harvest and into the wheat harvest too. And it's then that the book of Ruth tells us that Naomi hatches a security plan. Gleaning Boaz's fields, that'll feed them for the time. They can survive off of that. But Ruth would someday, like Naomi, she would grow old. And then who would go do the gleaning for her and take care of her in her old age? Both women need security for the future. And in a culture in which a woman's identity is tied to a male representative, well, Naomi sees in Boaz some potential. <laughs> he might just be a part of their security plan. He might be able to redeem them from their insecurity. So Boaz is kin through Naomi's deceased husband, and he can, according to their rules of community, he can make a claim on the inheritance of Elimelech. So Naomi shares with Ruth this daring and courageous, crafty, stealthy, and risky plan for their future to get Boaz to redeem the land and the family of Elimelech. So it's now the season for the winnowing of the grain. And Naomi advises Ruth to kind of, you know, fix herself up a little bit and approach Boaz in the evening after he's done the day's work and he's had a good dinner and some drink. She is to make clear her interest in him and then to ask him to spread his cloak over her. Yes, there's some symbolism here. This amounts to her asking him for a marriage proposal. It's very unconventional in their day and somewhat in ours. And once again, as with the first part of the story that we read last week, there are social norms, social mores that are being pushed and broken in this tale. Things are not being done the way they'd always been done before. New paths are being trod and even some boundaries are being broken. They didn't know what Boaz's response was going to be. Boaz could have rejected Ruth. He could have simply said, well, no thanks, but you can go on and keep gleaning my fields. And I guess that would have been all right. But he could have also been so offended by her that he said, I think I'm done with y'all. And that could have been the end of the story, cutting off even their access to the gleanings. But instead, he's complimentary, he's honest, he calls Ruth a worthy woman. But he says he will not enter into a covenant with her without first giving another relative a chance to be her kinsman redeemer. He is aware that there is some other relative in the family tree who he believes should have a, a greater claim on Elimelech's inheritance, that, that it was somehow closer and that it would not be right for Boaz to step in without this other man having a chance. So Boaz goes to see the man, and they meet at the city gate. And there are witnesses gathered here. This is kind of the way they did this sort of business. There's a group of ten men who are elders of the city, and they observe Boaz's negotiations with this other relative of Elimelech. 
And this other relative does indeed want Elimelech's land. He'll take the land, sure. But he doesn't want Ruth. But it's a package deal. So instead, before those witnesses there at the city gate, Boaz commits to acquire the hand from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and his sons who have died. And that includes Ruth. He commits to marrying Ruth, which will keep the whole inheritance intact. Naomi's clever security plan worked. Boaz and Ruth are married, and soon Ruth bears a son. For a story that began as disaster upon disaster, what a surprise happy ending this is. The two women are no longer unprotected, vulnerable, and impoverished. Now they have the security of a male provider, which was necessary in their culture. And they have that in Boaz for the present day. But then they also have something even more than they could have hoped for. They have hope for the future in this child who has been born to Ruth. This child who the women in the community name Obed servant of the Lord. In speaking to Naomi, Obed is described by the women in the neighborhood as a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age. And of Ruth, they say to Naomi, she is more to you than seven sons. Isn't it beautiful? It's just beautiful. What surprise this story brings. What a reversal of fortune Naomi, the woman who herself had lost so much, I mean, she's like the female Job figure here. She is so richly blessed, and the blessing comes to her through this faithful daughter-in-law, who was a foreigner, who was a widow herself. Ruth is a most unlikely hero in this tale, but she is a hero. So besides this being a quaint tale that we don't look at often enough from the Old Testament, what's the point? What do we learn here? I know there are a thousand lessons, but I'm going to suggest a few for us to be thankful for and remember today. There's good news here. First, I hear in this story that there is no one that God cannot use. There is no one God cannot use. God can use you. God can use me. God can use all of us. Secondly, that there is no situation in which God cannot work redemption. There is nothing that you have been through in life or will go through. There is no circumstance of your life through which God cannot redeem. And thirdly, there are no circumstances through which God's grace cannot appear. Even in your darkest hour, the darkest time you've had or will have in your life, there is absolutely no circumstance through which God cannot break through with God's grace, God's light, God's hope. As our real, ordinary, messy life goes on, Friends, remember that God is there. God is not absent. Surely these two women had their times where they thought, ay, 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 is God anywhere in this? And God was. The book of Ruth actually speaks very little directly of God, and yet it shows us this God who is the glue, who holds things together even when we think they're all unraveling. God is at work even as we go about devising plans and scheming to try to fix things and change things for ourselves and create security for ourselves, for our church. When we try to do our own redeeming, God is there. God is working. God works through simple folks in real life situations like yours and mine, in our circumstances. In our canon of scripture, in the order of the books of our Old Testament, the book of Ruth, if you've got your Bible or your app open, you can look at this. The book of Ruth is tucked between the grand story of the movement of of the whole tribe of Israel and the stories of the particularities of the lives of the kings who were raised up to lead Israel. And this unique little personal story 
reminds us that God is at work not only in the lives of kings and prophets and priests and judges, not only in the lives of those people who get in the news or in our media, but also in ordinary lives of regular folks like us. God speaks into our world through us. God acts in our world through us, through you. So then there's this sort of rapid wrap-up to this really short book of the Bible. And I know we just took a couple of chunks from chapter 1 and chapters 3 and 4, so go read it all through. But in this rapid wrap-up to the story, we have a glance at Ruth's family tree. And I know there's a tendency when we get to reading family trees in the Bible not to read them, just to skip right past them. But they're there for a reason. Where does the family tree go from here? Obed became the father of Jesse. Okay. Jesse was the father of David. That makes Ruth the great-grandmother of King David. The line of King David. She would never know, but she was the bearer of the line of the greatest and most revered king of her people. And it turns out that Naomi's security plan was so much greater than she could have imagined. It not only secured things for her and for Ruth in the immediate, but it also secured the future of her people, of her people. Remember who Ruth is. She's a foreigner. She's an outsider. She's an immigrant. And from her came the great line of King David. So the New Testament opens with a continuation of this. In Matthew, a recap of the family tree. I won't read it to you in its entirety, but here's how it begins. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and so on, until we come to, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David, and then it continues at verse 16, and so on, until generations later we come to another man named Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Oh yeah, God was at work in Naomi and Ruth. What a security plan. Not just for them, but for all of us. Through that faithful action of those women came our Savior. We make decisions, we hatch plans, we live our lives, our little stories, and friends, God is at work in it all, even if we don't see it sometimes. Sometimes in ways that are bigger than we'll ever see. Naomi had absolutely no idea just what a long-term security plan she was a part of. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'd like to be sure that each of you take the maroon booklet near the center aisle and that you register your attendance with us, both members and visitors alike.